<laughs> you have to go in. You have to try it. In central Iowa, a field of dreams, but not the cornfield made famous by the movie. This is a field of miscanthus grass. These dreams are about a new kind of energy future, where gas comes from grass. Is this heaven? No. It's Iowa. <laughs> This is the Sorensen Research Farm, and it's been dedicated to bioenergy crop production questions for the past couple decades. Okay, let's keep moving, but yeah, feel free to ask any questions. This is canola. I always consider Miscanthus gigantus to be sort of like the crock pot of plants because you set it and forget it. By that I mean you plant it once, you plant these rhizome pieces that are sort of onerous to plant the first year, but then the stand grows back every year after that for what we think probably 20 to 30 years. It's happening in Iowa. One of the main questions is how likely are genes from improved switchgrass to um, hybridize with, with native switchgrass? And it's happening in lots of other places, like eastern Tennessee. Researchers are working with different types of grasses and other cellulosic plant material to try and learn more about what it's going to take to grow our own fuel. It's a simple concept, turn grass into gas. Uh, but there are a lot of things that have to happen to make that happen and happen cost effectively. That's one of the biggest uh, factors is that it needs to be done sustainably and it needs to be done cost effectively. Sustainability, it's the promise of cellulosic energy crops. Cellulose is a complex carbohydrate found in most plants. It provides the sugars that can then be fermented into ethanol. This spring, we, we've converted about six acres of the 17 that are here to other research plots uh, for some high biomass sorghums and some, uh, and some different varieties of miscanthus. Sorghum, miscanthus, and one of the more popular energy grasses, switchgrass. But other cellulosic sources include wood waste and corn stover, that leftover material in the field after corn is harvested. But the energy grasses are not leftovers. They're grown specifically as a renewable fuel source. Switchgrass is high yielding grass. You've got a definite yield advantage over a lot of your other uh, perennial grasses. Perennial, that is the key to its sustainability and its environmental friendliness. Being a perennial crop, I would not be surprised if this stand was here 20 or 30 years from now. So 20, 30 years from now, if, if this stand is still here, that's 30 times that we haven't had to go across this field with a tractor, spraying, perhaps disking, disturbing soil, adding herbicides, adding fertilizers, 30 years of no disturbance. And if you think about it just from a bioenergy standpoint, my goodness, that is an awful lot of carbon that we're not using to produce ethanol or other energy sources. I'm Randall Peters and we're pretty diversified. We grow row crops, corn and uh, soybeans, wheat, and then we uh, also we grow uh, hay. And in recent years, Randall Peters has been working with nearby Genera Energy to grow a new crop, switchgrass. Last year we had a you know pretty severe drought, but we still got like four cuttings off of it, and uh, it handles the drought very well. With roots that go nearly 10 feet deep, switchgrass can handle drought much better than traditional row crops. But for farmers, there's an added attraction. First year is the hardest until you get it established, but it grows so fast that it'll just outgrow anything else. And we put our switchgrass on probably our more, less desirable ground for crops. It was some, some poor ground we had, and uh, it, did, it did really well on it. I mean, it, it'll, it'll grow anywhere, I think. This is an ISCO sampler. It's designed to collect water samples from the stream right next to us, the Little Nachi Creek. Well, this creek is draining the land area for Randall Peters' farm. Much of that land is covered with switchgrass, which does not require the fertilizers and pesticides that other crops do. 
In general, Tennessee streams, the main contaminant is sediment. So by having a perennial crop in the ground, a lot of that sediment could be alleviated. Since you're not digging up the ground to plant something new every year, you leave about eight to 10 inches of switchgrass in the ground and it has the long roots, so it stabilizes the soil. Good for the water, good for the soil, but perennial grasses offer another advantage. You know, a few things about why, why we see wildlife habitat value here. One, again, we've talked about it's not harvested during the summer. Two, it's tall, it provides good cover. But another reason that's important that I can show you down here, so what we refer to this as is a bunch grass. And what you can see is here's a bunch of the grass. Right here, here's another plant that is another bunch. But what you see is, because of the bunchy nature of it, there's a lot of space between the plants and a lot of open ground down here. And that's part of why this is so valuable to things like quail and rabbits, because their entire world is down here within six inches of the ground. And so they can run around through here. But if farmers are to grow these type of energy crops, they need a market. That's where the renewable fuel standard comes in. The renewable fuel standard sets a requirement, a minimum requirement of certain categories of renewable fuels that we are to blend in our U.S. fuel supply. And one component of that is a cellulosic fuel. The renewable fuel standard is a federal law that mandates a certain amount of our fuel comes from renewable sources. The primary contribution of the renewable fuel standard is that it provides kind of a base level of certainty to the future demand for these fuels, and it helps justify the investment over the long term. An investment that could lead to a more independent and more sustainable energy future.